Minister, a deep knowledge group uh, survey of 200 countries and territories have ranked Singapore as the fourth safest place to be in uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, technology use has boasted Singapore's ranking. Maybe perhaps you can give us a recap of some of the key smart nation projects and how they have provided the necessary groundwork to prepare Singapore for the pandemic. I would take a step back and look at the overall strategic picture. The world as a whole is a more dangerous place. It is headed towards greater disruption, greater division, and greater digitalization. These four Ds, these four trends, have been in play many years. COVID-19 has not altered history. It's accelerated these trends. That's the first point. The second point I wanted to make today was that if you think about jobs for the future, I believe the jobs are in high tech, high touch, and high art. And we'll elaborate on that later. And within the high tech portion of it, especially in areas like artificial intelligence, robotics, big data, machine learning. So that's the big picture of it. The next point I want to make is that, in fact, Singapore had a head start. And what, what do I mean by that? If you think about the computerization program, which in fact began in the late 70s and 80s, you know, way before even uh, PCs became commonplace, Singapore Civil Service had already started on it. If you think about uh, mid-2000, at that time, my colleagues in MICA, Ministry for Information, Communications and the Arts and I, were already dreaming of having fibre to every single home, every office. And we got that approved, and that rolled out by 2010, 2011. We had a truly fibred nation. If you now think about smart nation, actually the real push for this came from the Prime Minister. Sometime back in 2013, 2014, he felt, you know, he observed these trends and said, look, we've done well so far. We've computerized, we've connected, but we really need to prepare ourselves to harvest the opportunities that are going to come and also deal with the challenges that, are, that will arrive. So that's why he started the Smart Nation Initiative six, six years ago. Now, in the last six years, a couple of things have happened, and it answers the question that you, you put to me. First, we have recruited engineers, top flight talent, people who would otherwise be working in Silicon Valley into internet majors. We've been able to recruit, rebuild a hard core of engineering talent that has enabled government now to do in-house many things which it would have had to outsource in the past. Next is that we have been working very hard on building what we call platform technologies. By that, I mean things like digital identity. I mean, the manifestation of that is SingPass Mobile e-payment platforms, the manifestation is PayNow, PayLa, and all the other uh, digital wallets that you have. We've been working on secure sensor platforms, which are slowly, carefully being rolled out in place. So the reason I'm explaining all this is when COVID-19 suddenly erupted at the beginning of the year, we were starting, fortunately, from a position of strength and preparation. You think about it, we were already connected. We already had a digitally literate population. We have one of the highest smartphone penetration rates in the world. I think on average is 1.5 phones per person in, in Singapore. We already had the substrate of government services and platforms in place. So now if you cast your mind back to February, and you remember suddenly we had to distribute masks, and literally overnight, 
the team in GovTech were able to program Mask Go Wear. Because of all the budget announcements and the multitude of support packages for Singaporeans, the next website called Support Go Where was created. Similarly, contact tracing apps like uh, Trace Together, also created by a team of very bright young minds in GovTech, who wanted to create something new, a completely different model that would allow contact tracing to be conducted efficiently and still protect privacy. If you think about uh, other uh, apps or applications, I don't know whether you've noticed, if you go to some buildings, there is a automated artificial intelligence device that scans, recognizes your face, checks your temperature, and clears you. And if you look carefully at that device, it's running off a Raspberry Pi. It's running off an off-the-shelf uh, thermal scanner. The smarts is in the software, which is programmed. So you see, my point is, we were able to roll out all these things to meet an acute need very, very quickly because all the foundations were in place. So if you look now, you know, as we emerge from the circuit breaker, uh, I think we were very fortunate that our technology was in place. Most important, that our people were ready and uh, were able to respond to the acute needs of the emergency and of the crisis. And even now, as things go on and as we open up further and I'm sure the situation will continue to evolve, we will still need that same ability you know, to, to react, respond quickly, to generate solutions and to evolve. Right. Some people say that um, um, these smart nation projects and tech projects have become a luxury um, in a post-COVID world where basic needs like supply of food and water and so on is at risk because uh, post-COVID world is a less interdependent world. And um, do you see a need to, uh, what do you think of that? And do you th see a need to perhaps shift the focus uh, on some of these smart nation projects to other more immediate needs? Um, I can think of one example, home-based learning, for example. Well, as I said at the beginning, we are in a more dangerous phase. If you ask me about the prospects for war and peace, I'm more worried now than I was six months ago. We are more divided because, in fact, if you think about Silicon Valley and digital innovation, for the last 30 or 40 years, we've been building innovation upon innovation upon a common stack of technologies, both software and hardware. Now with the trade war and the tensions between America and China, there is a very real risk of technology bifurcation, of that common stack being broken, less interoperable, slowing the pace of innovation. And that's why I meant you know, we're headed towards a more divided and disrupted world. You are absolutely right. We must never forget that ultimately this is about human beings, human needs, and human opportunities. It's not technology for its own sake. So again, if you think about us and our experience just in the last three months with Circuit Breaker and now emerging from it, everyone has had to learn to communicate and not just using a phone, video conferencing, what lights to use, what cameras, what sounds, what settings to use, right? There has been a, in fact, the technology is not new, but we never felt that same sense of urgency to quickly learn it and use it. And I think this has been a, a wonderful opportunity. If you think about home-based learning, again, actually the technology itself it's not new and it's not difficult. The difficult part is the pedagogy, the curriculum, the syllabus, the content. That is the part 
which actually was much harder and requires a lot more work. It is not a technological question. And then if you think about, uh, you mentioned food, electricity and water. I can tell you from my past experience being the Minister for Environment and Water Resources, all these systems, our water production system, our water resilience and security, are actually very technology dependent too. And in fact, there's a lot going on which you don't see in the background, uh, but it works and it works seamlessly because the technology is there and PUB has invested in it consistently over many, many years. So I agree with you uh, that it is not about technology, it's about humans, beings, our needs and our opportunities. And that's why I also started by saying in the Smart Nation office, we haven't focused so much on you know, specific applications as focusing on enabling platforms. And uh, I'll give you examples of that. Once you have those pieces in place, whenever needs arise, you put smart people, you take a collaborative, open approach, you build on trust with the public, you can very quickly devise solutions and solutions which work and solutions that evolve to meet changing circumstances. So I'm quite confident that uh, as these new uh, needs have been surfaced by the urgency of COVID-19, Singapore will be able to meet it because we've got the infrastructure, we've got the people, and we've got the systems capable of generating solutions. I'm confident of that. You rightly mentioned uh, pedagogical changes. Yes. Um, is the Smart Nation Office uh, doubling down on efforts to, uh, to help um, the education sector in this? Or the Ministry in of Education is an expert in, in this field. And... Uh, you know, the teachers have been working very hard and I'm sure it will get better. Look, I have a 14-year-old son as well. And uh, like most parents, and I watch with anxiety because I suspect that most of the time he was actually playing games rather than interacting with his, with his teachers. But the ch nevertheless, the, I believe the challenge is on the software, on the education, on the interaction side of it. And the Ministry of Education is very focused on this. And uh, the other point which is worth emphasizing is inclusion. And one challenge that came to the fore again in the last few months was that suddenly, you know, people wanted additional laptops, personal laptops. Every child needed or wanted to have his own device. And many of us at the grassroots level were scrambling, you know, to buy or lend uh, these devices. And of course, the Ministry of Education, you heard Mr. Ong Yi Kang's announcement that uh, they will provide a personal learning device for every student. So again, what the point here I'm making is not about technology, it's about inclusion, making sure no one is left behind. And then it is about devising the solutions and the systems that make use of technology properly. Right. The Smart Nation uh, office is in a, is, as a coordinating ministry is in the best position to coordinate and to well, make sure I'm that... I'm not sure whether I would describe ourselves as a coordinator. I would say we are a facilitator. Right? We provide platforms, we connect different ministries, different agencies. We provide solutions only if there is an urgent gap and we need to fill it up very quickly as COVID did. Uh, other times, the lead agencies, the lead ministries will continue their work. The Smart Nation Office is not a ministry, so I would define our role as being a facilitator. Will the Smart Nation facilitate uh, the development of some of these programs to make them more suitable for content, for, make them more suitable for tablet access? And because uh, you mentioned digital divide, the new yes. PC program uh, for yes. needy families, yes. children, um, supply tablets and, and broadband access. Um, but we hear from the ground and from um, MPs in Parliament um, that children have problems with accessing um, learning programs on tablets because the program is not developed for optimal access on a tablet. Well, all these are teething issues that have to be resolved. You see, again, if you think about our own evolution, First, it was computers. Computers were not connected. Then you had connection and it was the internet and you had very rudimentary web surfing. Then you had 
web pages. Then you had web applications. And it took time. In fact, the smartphone only really took off in 2007. And then you now have an ecosystem of apps. And some things work well, apparently, on a phone or on a tablet. And you had a different application working on a computer. I think we are now headed to the age of convergence, which means regardless of what device you have, phone, tablet, or PC, you want to have the same experience, look and feel. And that is, again, not so much a technological question. It's really a design issue, and it's a software issue. But I want to reassure you that the Ministry of Education is acutely aware of this and is working very hard to have that confluence and that merger so that uh, it will truly be a seamless experience. But again, you know, speaking again from my experience as a parent, it's not just about being seamless, but the experience has to be engaging. It has to draw the student in. It has to be interesting and, you know, play on their curiosity. Okay. We'll move on to jobs. Yes. Um, it has been a hot button issue, yes. a hot topic uh, yes. for, for a long time, yes. and especially during uh, the pandemic, yes. it, it becomes more acute. Yes. Um, even tech firms like Grab is cutting back, is mm. cutting jobs, mm. and uh, refocusing its energies on delivery. Mm. How do you think the overall job market will be affected by um, the mm. uh, shifting of priorities for some companies to meet their immediate mm. needs? And um, do you think um, our smart nation goals and smart nation, and smart nation plans and our technology push mm. will provide the necessary uh, impetus for, mm. to create demand in this yes. sector? That, that's a great question, but it actually has to be answered <laughs> fairly comprehensively. Several things are happening right now. Number one is that we're in the middle of a crisis, and it's not just a healthcare crisis, it's the biggest economic crisis of our lifetime. Number two, it's not just happening in Singapore, it's worldwide. In fact, in my lifetime, I've never experienced a pandemic with a global economic downturn. So there's no doubt that overall revenues for most companies is going to be severely affected. That's the immediate impact. There is another trend going on, which is the ongoing digital revolution and the disruption that that causes. Now, let me be a little bit more specific. What has changed? The key change in the last few years is the impact of machine learning, neural networks, artificial intelligence, and the ability for computer systems to do pattern recognition, which formerly could only be done by human beings. That is why today, a computer can recognize a face, a computer can speak, a computer can understand instructions, a computer can even translate and interpret in real time. And this change has occurred in just less than five years. And that is why, you know, I started off by saying, if you think about where the jobs of the future will be, they are in high tech, high touch, and high art. And let, let me specify, I think high tech, we all already understand. If you're a programmer, if you're a UX designer, if you're uh, an expert in Python and artificial intelligence, machine learning, you program robots, or better still, you create robots, you understand machine vision, uh, you know, you have no shortage of jobs. In fact, people are looking for you. But the other area is high touch. I mean, healthcare, education, social services, where you actually need the touch the interaction from another human being. Those jobs, in fact, will continue to grow. So if you look at healthcare, you will definitely see an increase. Regardless of this crisis, even in the aftermath of it, there will be a continued demand for high-touch jobs. 
The other area which I believe has opportunity is what I call high art. What do I mean by that? If you can paint, write, videotape, direct, script write, sound, lights, those skills, those are very human skills. Those are specialized skills which machines cannot do and cannot do yet. And that's the other source of opportunity. So when we look at jobs, we have to understand both the short-term impact and then the medium to long-term trends. So if you look at what we're doing in Singapore right now, in the short term, you've, you've heard DPM Heng and his four budgets in two months. Number one priority was to preserve the current jobs by enabling our companies to have sufficient cash flow. And that's what the jobs support scheme. To tell the companies, as long as you're employing a Singaporean, you know, for those two months in circuit breaker, in fact, government was paying 75% of the salary. But that's not enough because we know the jobs are going to change. And so you see a lot of the budget is also on subsidizing, incentivizing the company to re-engineer its business and its processes so that it's ready for the new opportunities when the crisis recedes. And then you see there's another big chunk of support for skills retraining. Let, let me just give you some examples from the Infocom space since I know that well. Today in Singapore, there are about 200,000 people, professionals, in the Infocom space. Do we have enough? And I asked and I said, and they told me, well, in fact, our estimate is in the next three years, we need another 60,000 professionals, Infocom professionals. Then I asked my staff, well, when we started this Smart Nation journey six years ago, how many Infocom graduates were emerge from university a year. They said, oh, well, maybe a thousand. So they said, what was it three years ago? Oh, maybe a thousand two. What is it today? 2,800. But if you do the math, if you're graduating 2,800, and I tell you that over the next three years, we need 60,000, can you see there's an obvious shortage? So then you also understand why we're also focusing on mid-career change. People who have not been in the IT uh, industry, but are willing to go back, learn, relearn, upskill. And we that's why we're also trying to persuade thousands of people willing to learn to come into this sector. So you see, you, the point I'm trying to make is the importance of upskilling, of skills future, of providing pathways for people to move from current jobs to new jobs, but equipped with new skills. And if you just look at the numbers, you realize why we have our work cut out for us. So don't just look at what is disappearing or in danger, but look at the opportunities. And that's why uh, I'm so happy that uh, Senior Minister Taman is chairing the National Jobs Council, uh, because he will ensure that it's a whole of, not just whole of government, but whole of nation effort. Because we need the training institutions to step up. We need employers to change mindsets. We need people willing to come out of our comfort zones, learn new things, take on new jobs. And we need to make sure that these jobs go uh, with good wages and, you know, and we should not have to apologize that we are tilting the playing field in favor of our own citizens. We, do, we, may do, we may need foreigners to supplement us or to help us to expand the overall pie, but the core of it and the bulk of the opportunities must come to our own people. 
the pandemic um, has kind of put a dampener on demand for some of these jobs at the moment. When do you see demand soaring again and the highest? Uh, put, well, put like I said, it will depend on which kinds of jobs. Uh, in the tech space, uh, the shortage is there. I mean, even in government, we are short of, as I told you, we're short of engineers. And it's not a matter of paper qualifications, you know, because certainly for, again, coming back to computer scientists and engineers, I don't really need to look at your degree. I just need to look at your code. I just need to know what projects you have worked on. And when we actually work with you after a while, it doesn't take very long to f discover whether someone has that ability to function at the level that we demand or not. So certainly in the, the tech space, I, there, there will be a shortage. There is a shortage and the shortage will become more acute as the economy recovers. It's the other areas, retail, F&B, that kind of areas which I think will take longer to recover. And the answer is so when it will recover is that it depends on when we will be rid of COVID-19. And the fact is, this is not going to happen in a hurry. Uh, it is a pandemic. It has become endemic, meaning it is now embedded in the world. Even if you are now, at this point in time, free of it, there will always be the risk of second, third, and fourth waves. The only thing that will change will be a discovery of a vaccine that is effective and effective for the long term. If you speak to the doctors, nobody is in a position to give you that warranty yet. So the next few months, in fact, the next year or two, are likely to be quite volatile, difficult years. But what I'm trying to do is to remind people that for the short-term pain, government will help. We will do our best. But remember that we have to have a medium to long-term agenda to transform our, ourselves. Upskill humans, transform our enterprises, restructure our economy. And that has to be the focus going forward. And uh, technology is just part of that narrative. It just so happens that technology is a positive part because there's so many opportunities and such great needs. You mentioned earlier about um, bifurcation of supply chains yes. with the US-China tension. Yes. And um, how will it affect the supply of materials as Singapore build out some of our most critical um, futuristic infrastructure like 5G and so on? And um, how do we make sure that our running costs do not go up when uh, two standards emerge from the uh, bifurcation? Well, this is something we are watching very, very carefully. You know, Singapore has benefited enormously in the last 55 years of independence, or in fact, in the last 70 years of peace and stability in Asia. That gave us time and the opportunity to invest in infrastructure, to invest in people, and to re structure our economy uh, to meet the needs of the world. So I'll tell you honestly, the last 70 years have been great years of opportunity for a place like Singapore. Now, if this formula for peace and prosperity breaks down, we're going to have to be very, very watchful. What's happening around us, and in particular, what we need to do domestically. So let, let's come back to your question on what happens if there is really a technological bifurcation. And I would say the first answer is we have to look at ourselves. Do we have enough engineers? Are we doing sufficient research and development to contribute to the evolution of standards in the world, industrial and technical standards. Next, do we remain open to talent and are we connected to the, all the other countries in the world who still believe in open collaboration and 
standardization and free trade and the ability to exchange services on the basis of efficiency and utility. So I think there is still a lot that we can do. You cannot insulate ourselves completely from the problems with the superpowers, but you can make, we can make ourselves more resilient. So my specific recommendations are, first, we will continue to invest in infrastructure, whether it is broadband, 4G, 5G, and beyond. We make a commitment that we will always stay at or near the bleeding edge of technology, first thing. Second, invest in people. Our universities, our technical institutions, our adult education options, our skills future must continue to provide opportunity after opportunity for people to learn, relearn, stay current, stay ahead of the game. So that's on the people side of it. There's another element which I want to emphasize, which is that it is absolutely essential for Singapore to remain open and a trusted focal point. In the past, we used to be a trading hub. So if you go back 700 years, silks, spices. If you go back 40 years, containers. Today, increasingly, it is about finance. It is about data. It's about bits. And even in a disrupted and divided world, we must remain an open and reliable and trusted centre for data, for information, for ideas. And it's no accident that one of our fastest growing uh, you know, phenomena, which in fact had surprised me, are data centres. It surprised me because data centres in Singapore cannot be the cheapest in the world. Our energy costs, we do not subsidise energy. And I was surprised. But yet, if you speak to all the internet majors, all of them have data centres here. Many of them are expanding. Why? Because in a disrupted and divided world, places which remain open, reliable, trusted, they know the government, when it signs something, it will strictly comply with the, with the terms of the contract. It knows that we will never requisition data or supplies even in an emergency. And I can tell you, you know, without getting into details now, even in the depths of this crisis, the Singapore government has been scrupulous in honouring contracts, in not impounding or confiscating anything that wasn't ours or anything that belonged to any other company or any other country. This reputation, openness and trust, puts us in a very good position when the recovery comes. So the point is, we have to be sensitive to what's happening outside, but there's a lot that we can do to make ourselves more resilient and more relevant. And the other point I wanted to make, you know, beyond uh, openness and investment, the third limb is inclusion. And you will notice Minister Iswaran, you know, he set up the, the SG digital office. He's appointed 1,000 digital ambassadors. And not only will they be holding the hands of seniors and others who would otherwise be at risk of being left behind, but if need be, I know he will even subsidize devices to make sure no senior, no child is left behind in this digital revolution. So again, I see both a crisis and I see opportunities. And I see the fact that actually Singapore has a head start and we have strengths that we can count on that will put us in a good position, even in such a, a difficult and dangerous world. And uh, you mentioned opportunities. I think one of the... Yes. 
opportunities that presented itself was in uh, digitalization and the use of um, some of our uh, uh, technologies that we've developed in Singapore and uh, SingPass Mobile is one of those. Yes. And um, the EID uh, yes. has the barcode of our NRIC has yes. been included in the SingPass Mobile app. Mm -hmm. When do you see the EID um, replacing the physical um, NRIC card and yeah. can we go to the ballot box with just our SingPass Mobile uh, EID? Um, I would not rush into it and, and, and let me explain. Again, you know my attitude that it's not technology for technologies, you see. If you can create technology, it makes it more convenient. So for instance, to check in or to open a bank account or to register for services, which is what we have done with SingPass Mobile, with My Info, with Moments of Life. You know, all these are government services. In fact, 90% of all interactions with government now are online. That's fine. But I always, always pay attention to inclusion. Make sure that you are not leaving anyone out of it. And until and unless you can make sure that everyone is included, you must not shut down other options. You ask specifically about elections. Well, I don't, you know, I'm not in charge of the elections department, but let me give you a personal take from experience. An election is not just about counting. I mean, machines can count. Right? It's also a human interaction and experience, the need to seek consent, concurrence, to win support, to explain, to be questioned. All that is part and parcel of what makes a democracy. In the case of Singapore, because we are so small, uh, and the fact that every vote can be seen, felt, and counted by the opponents and by the electoral officer, uh, I think has a special significance to it. And you know, that's why I personally, I'm not in a hurry uh, that yes, it's true, a machine could count, but there's still something sacred about a human experience, a human interaction. And then at the end of the process, the winner has a mandate and the person who has not succeeded can accept that that is the decision, the outcome of decisions made by the electorate. So always, always think in human terms. So, so my... my uh, my short answer is I'm not in a hurry to, to do that yet, but you know, you have to ask the Prime Minister or the Prime Minister of the future. Right. Well, the pandemic has uh, provided some opportunities for e-voting to, to surface, right? I mean, since um, it, it's more risky for older people to, to go out. So it is an opportunity. Is, 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 that, is that not? I think it's, a, it's something we should think about. Uh, for this election, whenever it's going to be called, I think we will still, uh, it will still have to be a human uh, interactive process. What it means is the elections department has to take extra care. Uh, and I think they have increased the number of voting stations, polling stations, in order to reduce the numbers present. I think they will give, take precautions like giving you recommended hours. Uh, I'm sure they'll take all the necessary uh, precautions. So. We have to get the, the balance, the balance right. I mean, so we'll, you know, I'm, I'm sure they will do the right thing. Singapore is entering phase two of this reopening. It yes. is a critical phase yes. and the contact tracing becomes all the more important. Yes. And um, we have a talk, I mean, you have um, announced the uh, issuing of a trace together token, a wearable device, um, mm. so that it can be more inclusive. Yes. Um, if voluntary, do you think people will use the device? I, you see, again, my approach to it is to take a human-centric view. It is very easy to say make it mandatory, very easy. But if you really want, if we as Singaporeans, as a society, are really going to make ourselves safe 
and COVID proof. There are many things which you can't do by legislation, by compulsion, or by technology. In the end, we need every single Singaporean to understand the risks, to take responsibility, and to protect himself or herself and the loved ones and the neighbours and the colleagues. So the reason why I have not pushed that this be compulsory is I believe this is another opportunity to have a conversation, an explanation and to get voluntary cooperation you know, and that people do it because they understand it and not because they have to. Even the whole question on tokens was really just about inclusion. Because I told you, although I told you that on average, there's supposed to be 1.5 phones per Singaporean. Now, on the ground, we are experiencing a significant number still do not have phones. And there are significant numbers, even if they have a phone, it will not run the latest software applications or even the latest uh, you know, the, uh, protocols which Apple and Google are trying to push. It will not work on the old phones. And because of my strong belief in digital inclusion and leaving nobody behind, we had to make sure that whatever we devised, whatever software we created, will work even without a phone and on a device that is simpler and cheaper than a phone. So my key motivation is inclusion, protection, and safety, especially for people who would otherwise be left behind. That's, that's really the motivation behind it. Is the government exploring ways to incentivize the use of the Trace Together app um, through maybe gamification or other um, uh, incentives? Yes. Well, you will notice that uh, we open sourced it. So in fact, the source code is there. Uh, and there were several reasons why I insisted on open sourcing it. First is I'm a believer in open source that the spirit behind open source, if you share something, you help engender a collaborative approach to improving services. You build trust and you build a community. But you could say I'm being ideological about it. So, Let's just leave that as a motivation. But on a practical level, by open sourcing it, if there are problems or bugs that need to be fixed, the community out there will inform GovTech and we will make the changes. Third, it proves there's no backdoor. What you see is what you get. If we tell you we're not tracking your location, you can see we're not tracking your location. Fourth, as you said, if someone can come to us now and say, hey, you know, your program is so elegant and so simple. In fact, I can make it work on something more attractive, more interesting, or something which people are more likely to use. I will happily say, please, take it, create something, submit it to us, let's look at it. And if it meets the security and the privacy uh, conditions that we have to impose, it can become part of the ecosystem. So that's our approach to it. So whether it is hardware, software, uh, I'm going to go for an open, you know, open source, open standards, open platforms. I, I, I strongly believe that is the way to go in the future, to make things better and to build a community and to build trust. And I do believe we need trust and cooperation and that sense of collective responsibility. Is the government thinking of um, open sourcing the uh, token, the uh, platform? Uh, it is a very simple platform. In fact, uh, to have an announcement. Anyway, tomorrow we're, getting, we're bringing some hackers to do a teardown. Uh, frankly, Irene, if I gave it to you and I opened it, you, you, would, know, you would see straight away. How, how, how simple and the schematics and all that. Uh, when it is produced, I mean, I think it's supposed to be end, end of the month or so. It depends on when it arrives. I mean, we, we, at the moment, we just have prototype boards, which are, which are quite ugly, obviously, you know, a prototype board. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. But but this spirit of openness to me is is crucial because uh, as, I, as I explained to you before, what I'm really trying to get across is conversation, education, responsibility, a collective approach to securing our health and our security. We have called for a sec second tender. Is there going to be a third tender? And how many of these devices will we, will well, we produce in total? No, it, I think it depends. First, how many we need. I, um, if you have a phone that works, and you're happy with it, you probably don't need it. If you don't have a phone or your phone is too old or it doesn't work, we will give it to you free. So our focus initially is on the digitally excluded. So that, so the, the question then is how many will we really need amongst the local population? I will say that is something which we will have to adjust according to time. And that's why we haven't, that's why we're tendering in steps. So according to need and according to, to circumstances. And like I told you, you know, if someone else comes to me and says, I've got an even, uh, I'm able to take your software and make it run on a different platform. And you can assure me that, you're, that it's secure and that it's pro protecting privacy. We will happily look at it. So it's an open, open evolutionary approach. Um, the other point of course, is that you must recall that in good times, Singapore had 17,000 tourists every year. And clearly, if we reopen Singapore and COVID-19 is not over yet, then we do need to have contact tracing available for tourists as well because they would also have an impact on our health. So that's why the numbers would, you know, we, it would have to evolve according to the needs of the, it depends on how COVID evolves. As a follow-on question, um, yes. under what circumstance would we mandate the use of um, Bluetooth uh, tracing? I am very reluctant to go there for the reasons I explained. And you see, it's like today, we have two million voluntarily doing it as an act of collective responsibility. Uh, we will keep pushing and Again, if you are mathematical about it, uh, contact tracing uh, apps is an example of a network effect. Meaning, if only one person had the app, it's absolutely useless. Two persons, marginal. But each additional user, in fact, increases the efficacy of it by a square. You know? You, if you understand, I mean, there's mathematics behind it, but there's a square function to the utility of a network. And uh, we, we will continue to, to, to push it. And let, let, let's, let's give it some time. I, I, I still have confidence in Singaporeans. Right. <laughs> Do you have any concerns about the reliability of Bluetooth signals? It goes through walls, it def it's reflected uh, from metal surfaces, and it may um, well, create false negatives. Okay, so there are two things. Uh, first of all, we are only really interested in close contacts. And according to our health experts, close contacts means one to two meters for 15, 30 minutes, right? I'm not really worried about if you're on the other side of the wall in a completely separate room and you in fact have no interaction with me. So what we are measuring is both uh, what we call false positives and false negatives. Right? Uh, the data, we were monitoring the data and if need be, we can make adjustments to the, uh, to the parameters of the algorithm. So that, that's something which we will continue to watch. But so far, uh, at least what I've seen and, and even you know, play, I mean, I've had a prototype and I've checked it. It's surprisingly accurate. It, uh, the prototype that I have will distinguish between you sitting there or if you were in front of me. It, it actually works. I, I, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm quite pleased uh, with that. Okay. We'd like to take a look at it when it's ready. <laughs> I think the timekeepers are, yes. are signaling. One last question. Yes. Is there any reason to be wary of big tech firms? I mean, I'm referring to the Apple Google system. 
um, um, and also the, the history no, I, I of would, tracking? And well, frankly, they track far more than governments. And they track for commercial reasons. Right. But having said that, uh, again, my approach to them uh, is to promote open source. So that's why, as I told you, in the case of uh, Blue Trace, which is a protocol behind our trace together, we open sourced it. In fact, we had discussions with both Apple and, and Google on it. Uh, similarly, when they came up with their exposure notification system, I mean, we've had an interaction. I, mean, I myself have spoken to the senior, very senior levels. Uh, I am very tempted to challenge them open source it all. I think that will be a good and positive move for the world. Uh, and don't just publish APIs. I mean, here I'm going to get a bit tangled. Don't just give me API calls. Publish it down to the source code, to the operating system modules, which relate to Bluetooth. After all, we are all facing a common a common thread. And it's not a matter of whose technology is superior or inferior. Let's open source, let's collaborate, and let's try to make things better and safer. So I do not view the internet majors as rivals or adversaries. I very much want them to be partners. And I think, to be fair, I think they are moving in that direction. But let's keep the conversations going and keep it open.